What's going on, guys? My name is John, and I'm with the Fantasy Tap. Thank you again for joining in on another great episode of our round-by-round -round breakdown. Today, going to be going over round six and seven. As we get later on in this half-point PPR 12-man league, uh, I'm going to be going over the players that we're going to start getting into our sleepers. We're going to start getting into the players we think are great values, uh, players with a lot of upside. Going to go a little bit quicker over the players that we're going to tell you to wait a little bit later on um, and just let you know where we think they're going to be finishing and what situations you might grab them in. Um, but before we jump into that, if you guys would love a shot in winning a full-size Kyler Murray signed helmet um, that you can see in tomorrow's episode where Michael will be doing rounds eight and nine, uh, if you want a shot to win that, we are doing our Fantasy Tap Listener League, which is a 12-man half-point PPR league, uh, and we will be raffling away 11 of the spots. We are giving one spot to the winner of last year's league, uh, because he obviously champion, uh, defending his title against 11 players. Uh, if you want a spot in this league and in the raffle, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, let us know you're a subscriber and you're interested on a DM on either Instagram or Twitter at the fantasy tap. Uh, and if you guys want a second chance into this raffle, um, all you have to do is be a member of our discord group, which will be linked down below in the description of both the podcast and the YouTube video. Um, and, and it is an absolutely great place to find players uh, for new fantasy leagues, get updates. Uh, there's a rate your team section where you can post uh, your current rosters, your bench, see how you're doing and see if anyone has any recommendations about what you can do to make sure you win your league. Um, make sure you get a part of that. Get that second chance in the raffle. Get that spot in the listener league to win that helmet and get your spot in next year's league uh, by being that champion automatically. Now, let's jump into round six, um, and we're going to start off with someone that I was surprised that had such a great season last year. Um, he finished his wide receiver 24, and it's going to be Robbie Anderson. Uh, this year going as wide receiver 29, um, a highly targeted guy in a offense that wasn't expected to be as great as it was. Um, Teddy Bridgewater really lit it up, keeping DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, and Curtis Samuel all relevant in fantasy football last year. Uh, Robbie obviously finished as the eighth most targeted receiver in 2020, um, and he did see a huge role in that offense. Um, with Sam Darnold coming into town and taking over that starting quarterback role, and then Christian McCaffrey coming back as well, I just don't see Robbie Anderson finishing as a receiver that's that highly targeted. Though Curtis Samuel did leave, they did spend high draft capital on Terrence Marshall Jr., who is coming in and already making a name for himself. Um, I do think that Robbie Anderson is someone that could bring you value, but he is a boomer bust player and he's someone that I don't think you're going to be able to predict the weeks that he's going to boom. Um, unless DJ Moore or Terrence Marshall is just not relevant for a week because due to injury or something else. Um, I just don't see Robbie Anderson being a safe pick for that roster spot on a lineup. Uh, and if you can grab him later in the draft and you're comfortable with the players you already have, then you can take him. And he's someone that I do see dropping just because he isn't someone that's been predominant year in and year out. Uh, coming up next, we've actually got Michael Thomas. Obviously, since the, in since the surgery, uh, his ADP has fallen completely uh right now he's listed as wide receiver 30 and i really don't think that's where he's going currently he might even be going later uh if you guys go check out our last episode which is our half point ppr mock drafts with actual players uh and real people mocking with us uh mike actually grabbed michael thomas late in the draft after he's already grabbed established receivers that could get him through the year and that's really the only situation you're gonna be wanting to grab him he's not some obviously he could be missing an undisclosed amount of time um and early estimations were six to 12 weeks. Um, the Saints haven't given an actual timeline yet. Um, most recent comment from Sean Payton actually was that he is ahead of schedule. Again, no schedule has been given. But this guy's an extremely highly targeted guy, regardless of whatever quarterback is going to be there. Uh, last season, he was still seeing 12 to 15 targets. Um, obviously, Drew Brees did finish out the season, and he's no longer there. Uh, but regardless if it's Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston, when Michael Thomas does come back, he's going to be bringing you value. The problem is he's not going to be someone that you're going to want to reach on because if you're taking him, that means that you've already got – three running backs, if not four, two wide receivers you can count on putting in your wide receiver one and two spot week in and week out. Um, and you don't need to have another wide receiver, but 
he's a risky play. We don't know when he's coming back, but we do know that he's someone that could help push you through the playoffs and win your league if you grab him with some stability on that roster. Um, so grab him if he falls, but don't go targeting him. Someone I actually am targeting is going to be TJ Hawkinson, though. Um, he's currently going as tight end six at the 603, um, and he's in an offense where they don't have – they only have one receiver uh, from last season. That's Quintez Safis. Uh, the Lions are going to be someone that's going to be targeting TJ Hawkinson like he's the guy. Um, he's one of the most talented receivers on the roster. I'm per- currently uh, a huge fan of Amon Ross St. Brown this season. Uh, but they also did add Tyra Williams, who did look really good in the preseason game. Obviously, preseason is preseason. But Hawkinson was someone that already saw 100 targets last season. Um, and with the additional game, he could push up to that point where he gets 100 catches this year. Uh, with that high volume, you're looking at someone that with touchdown upside uh, will only bring you more and more points. I think that TJ is someone that can finish within the top five tight end this year easily, if not pushing himself into the top four. Uh, I'm actually drafting him above Mark Andrews. Um, and just behind Kyle Pitts personally. Um, And that's someone I'm really targeting because I feel like he's going to be bringing you that high end tight end upside week in and week out. Um, And that's something that I find really important with that position, being able to put up a lot of points compared to what you get out of lower end tight end. Um, And I I think he's going to bring, bring you a lot of value. Uh, Another guy that's going to bring you value though is Dak Prescott. Currently at quarterback five, it kind of feels like we're drafting and talking about the 2020 preseason where everyone is expecting Dak Prescott to get into the league and light it up. And, I mean, the guy did. In 2019, he finished as a quarterback, too, threw for almost 5,000 yards uh, and threw for 30 touchdowns. 2020, he came out looking even better uh, in a fantasy aspect just due to the fact that that defense was playing so poorly. Uh, But on pace in those five games to throw almost 6,000 yards um, as well as 30 touchdowns again. Um, He's someone that's going to be part of a very high-powered, high-volume offense. And with minor rushing upside especially post injury and post payment they're not going to be running them like they used to uh but Dak Prescott someone that you can expect to bring you consistent value with high end point games um and at quarterback five you're taking a, a good shot on him but you're getting value out of it um if he falls for any reason because someone decides to pick him up later you have to take Dak Prescott Um, With the upside there, it could be a league-winning quarterback um, finishing in the top three, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Going at the 605 is actually running back 24, Javante Williams. Now, he's getting drafted above the running back that's starting above him currently, Um, and that's because there's a lot of hype about what he can do later in his career, uh, later into the season, hopefully, if he is able to take over that role from Melvin Gordon. Um, I think Melvin Gordon is an extremely talented back. We saw what he could do with the Chargers uh, back in when they were playing in San Diego. And you cannot think that Melvin Gordon is just going to walk away. He is going to have a role in that offense. Um, A lot of the value for Javante comes in the fact that there's expectations that he takes over a very predominant role later on in the season. And if you're grabbing this guy as a late running back too, you need to make sure that you're grabbing him after you've already got running backs you can play for more than half the season comfortably. Um, Williams will have that upside later on, but I personally just don't think he's got enough value at running back 24. Um, Very, very comfortable grabbing him as like running back 28, 30, um, where you're starting to pick up players who are either in a running back by committee with limited upside or in a similar situation where the expectations are going to be later on in the season when even when he does take over, you still might only see running back two numbers. Uh, the Broncos offense isn't the most high volume, high, high value, but Javante Williams is extremely talented in both the pass catching game, as well as the rushing game to where he will have a predominant fantasy role. Just don't grab him too early. Don't go targeting him. He's someone I'll grab if I, if he falls and I can take that bench player. Uh, moving on, we got Jerry Judy currently going as wide receiver 31, sticking with this Broncos theme. Uh, banged up throughout most of 2020, but still played for most of his games. Uh, and he's going into his second year in what seems to be an improved Drew Locke from the first preseason game. Um, or we get Teddy Bridgewater, which I mentioned earlier, was able to keep Curtis Samuel, uh, DJ Moore, and... <clears throat> Robbie Anderson, valuable uh, in fantasy aspect. Um, And I think it's enough upside for Judy this year to be comfortable taking him, Um, especially with the fact that Cortland Sutton's coming back this year, hopefully healthy. 
a little bit of pressure off of Judy this year would be go miles. Uh, last year, he was able to go for 800 yards, problem being only three touchdowns. Those numbers really could have been boosted with some consistent quarterback play. We got to remember last year, the Broncos, not only did they play a wide receiver quarterback for a week, but they also had situations where the Drew Locke, who is someone that was still trying to prove himself, uh, was out because of COVID mandate and just wasn't playing. We had Brett Ripien playing last year. Uh, and Judy, obviously, is not going to be able to put out his best numbers there. If Drew Locke takes a step forward or Teddy Bridgewater comes up, we're talking about someone that has top 10 wide receiver upside with his play after the catch or yards after catch ability, his ability to take the open field and make it into an easy touchdown, uh, extremely shifty from what we saw in college and, and showed flashes in his limited opportunities last season. Um, I think he's someone that if you're grabbing as a wide receiver two, you're, you're pretty happy with that. I mean, obviously wide receiver 31, you're almost grabbing him as a, as a third wide receiver and you're going to be getting a lot of value in there. Uh, coming up next, we got Miles Gaskin, currently running back 25. Uh, he was, a lot of, for a lot of people, a sleeper pick. Um, but after the first preseason game, we saw Malcolm Brown come in uh, early and taking over a strong starting role. And that definitely takes away a lot of Miles My, Gaskin's upside. The problem for Gaskin was he was an absolute stud in fantasy last year, especially after week nine when Tua came in. Um, he was actually never fell below running back 14, finishing as a top 10 running back three out of the six weeks that he actually played in those uh, from week nine on. Um, and his problem was that he wasn't super healthy, um, but he was a great three down back. Uh, if Malcolm Brown is that starting running back for us, um, do not grab Miles Gaskin. He's someone that's going to be take, in my opinion, I think he's going to take over the role from Malcolm Brown. Uh, Malcolm Brown does have that red zone uh, rushing upside, that goal line back build but miles gaskin is someone that's talented and it's going to be a running back by committee um and hopefully you can grab him for a value and he has a chance to really take over in that offense um but don't go spending the pick on him right now i'm avoiding him after this week uh going at 608 it's actually court and sutton we're going to be finishing up these broncos pretty quick it looks like uh wide receiver 32 and only played in one game last year so we can't really look at what happened then um, but before the before Jerry Judy was there, he was able to rack up 1,100 yards on 72 catches uh, in 2019. And with Jerry Judy there as well, I think they're both going to value or both get some upside from the other guy being there. Uh, both receivers extremely talented. Cortland Sutton proved that he can handle that offense by himself, putting up solid fantasy numbers. But with Jerry Judy there taking off a little bit of pressure on the on the on the back end. It just gives them a chance for both players to be able to thrive and have solid numbers. They do cap each other slightly. Um, I do think Jerry Judy is the better receiver, but again, we've seen multiple teams be able to reduce two high-end receivers. Uh, and I think Cortland Sutton's gonna be bringing you a lot of value week in and week out. Um, doesn't really have that wide receiver one upside, but he brings you such a confident floor that you can play him almost weekly. Um, and then he might have games where he booms out. Uh, and if Drew Locke is someone that balls and gets that starting role completely, he earned it over Teddy Bridgewater, who's someone that you can just throw in there and at least he'll air the ball out. So I think that Cortland Sutton's another safe pick. And if you can take him as your second or third wide receiver, you're not doing too bad. Coming up next, we got Kareem Hunt. Um, and while a lot of people used to consider him a sleeper, he's been jumping up the draft boards quite a bit. Um, and I'm not super hot on him. Uh, obviously, he came back. He played weeks one through four as the lone back in uh, Cleveland, and then Nick Chubb came in after that, and he was still able to find some relevancy, mainly due to the fact that he's an extremely great receiving back, as well as being a good running back, uh, being able to run anyone over. Um, but Hunt does carry a lot of value if Chubb misses time, uh, as we saw in weeks one through four. The problem for me is though. Without that touchdown upside, he's not getting enough touches. You're grabbing someone who does get touches every game, receiving work every game, um, and then will vulture a couple touchdowns here and there. But if you're looking for someone that you can play every week in and out and expect high-end numbers or a big, big game, you're not going to get it from them. You're going to be getting mid-range numbers to the point where you might regret playing them. Uh, after week five, uh, once Nick Chubb came back, he was uh, Kareem Hunt was running back 19 on the season. Or I'm sorry, through weeks five through 17, 
But if you remove the one game where he had a two touchdown game and only six touches in week 14, he instantly falls to running back 31 in that time frame, um, which automatically you're not getting that value at running back 26. Uh, he had multiple point, multiple games where he was getting 10 points or less, um, and he's not going to be as safe as a lot of people are rejecting him to be. Um, but if you're looking for someone and you're in a deeper league where running backs have gone very, very quickly and you've neglected that position or you've gone with a zero RB strategy, Kareem Hunt, someone that can get you almost guaranteed eight points per week with the opportunity to get you high-end numbers. But we're, if you're in a league where running backs are still somewhat valuable and you can looking to put this guy as your number two running back because you grabbed a receiver or grabbed a tight end, I'm just not doing it. Uh, there are still some running backs down below uh, who can get you a lot of value. Um, Chubb, someone or Hunt is someone that I'm looking to grab again at that running back 30 um, with a different idea than Javante Williams. Coming in at number 610, we're looking at Devontae Smith, wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, previous Heisman Trophy winner, um, and looking to already walk into a number one receiving role for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, a lot of beat reporters coming out after week one of the preseason talking about how Jalen Hurts is definitely that franchise quarterback for the Eagles, and that could mean a lot of great things for Devonta Smith. Um, he's already been a little bit banged up, and I think he's pretty high risk, in my opinion, at wide receiver 33. He does have the upside of finishing as a wide receiver two at the end of the year, but I think the quarterback play in Philadelphia with Hurts being someone who will run the ball, um, but they also like to target their tight ends very frequently. In week one of the preseason, we've already seen Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz find some work, as well as there being other receivers there um, that are still unproven. It's a very young, young receiving core, and the ball can get spread out a lot. We really don't know how many targets Smith is looking to have by the end of the season. And we haven't even seen what he can do against a full-speed NFL team. Being drafted this early, I think, is a high-risk, high-reward situation. There is a realm where he could be a top two receiver or top wide receiver two, getting 100 plus targets throughout the season. 130 targets, just being the fact that the other receivers could be terrible. Um, but you're getting someone that also who could be an absolute bust with the Eagles' draft history. And I'm staying away from most of the Eagles' receivers at this point. Moving on, we got DJ Chark, wide receiver 34, going off the board at the 6'11", so grabbing him just at the end of the sixth round. Um, he is the proposed core wide receiver one for their new quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, and last season um, and the year prior was kind of a boomer blessed player uh, with Gardner Minshew under, under center. Uh, since getting to town, Urban Meyer has really been putting a lot of pressure on Chark um, to be the guy that he was drafted to be um, and the talent that Meyer said he sees in him. Um, but since camp, Chark is beginning to get praises from Meyer uh, before it turns out that he is suffering from a hairline finger fracture um, that currently he just got some surgery for. He should be okay for week one. Um, but you're grabbing him as a top 34 receiver, and I think you're going to be grabbing him in that boomer bust situation. You're not looking to start him as that wide receiver too. But you could be getting a lot of value for him. Obviously, my reasoning for that is the fact that they do have LaVisca Chenault. They do have James Robinson. They drafted Travis Etienne. There's Marvin Jones there as well. There's a lot of new targets there and a lot of players. And LaVisca and James Robinson and Etienne could all take steps forward. And we don't even know what that offense is going to be looking like with a new quarterback and a new head coach there. Uh, Urban Meyer really does like his run game. But, you know, he kept Ohio State's quarterbacks moving the ball pretty, pretty well. Uh, so I do think that DJ Chark is someone that you can grab as a value, um, but you do have to understand that he might finish as a wide receiver one or two based on the volume that he could be getting from Lawrence with upgraded quarterback play, but he also could be someone that could finish at the low floor, uh, either mid not being able to finish the entire season, which he hasn't been able to do yet, or just not being able to be the guy for Meyer that Meyer wants him to be. Uh, I do think that you should take the pick on him. I have him in a couple of leagues, so I might be a little biased there. Um, but wide receiver 34, expect low-end wide receiver two numbers with wide receiver one upside from him. Uh, Debo Samuel coming at wide receiver 35. 
I, I kind of like it. Um, we already saw in week one of the preseason, Trey Lan- or Jimmy Garoppolo targeted Debo Samuel in the first pass. So he's going to be seeing some sort, of, uh, some sort of targets, even though we are expecting George Kittle and Brandon Ayuk to take big roles in that offense in a pretty run healthy team. Um, obviously, they do have a 58% pass share uh, in their offense last season, even though Garoppolo missed the majority of it. Um, but the problem for me with Samuel is the fact that the only good game where he finished outside of the top 24 receivers, um, above a top 24 receiver, um, in the limited games that he plays was the one game that Kittle and Ayuk were out and he played, um, he averaged 10 and a half points, but take away that 22.4 point game. And you're looking at 6.4 points. Um, Debo Samuel was not very consistent last year. But again, banged up. He will have really good flex appeal in mid to deep roster leagues. Um, but you're still at that point in the draft where you might be trying to grab your wide receiver three um, or your wide receiver two if you've gone running back heavy. And I don't think that's someone you're going to be looking for that upside right now. Um, I will take him in the next round, uh, at the end of the next round, possibly at the beginning of the eighth if he falls. Um, there's still some upside players here. Coming up next, uh, a boomer bust player again, uh, a sleeper for a lot of people, especially in best ball leagues. That's going to be Michael Gallup at wide receiver 36. Um, Michael Gallup will be a wide receiver on a high volume, a wide receiver three on a high volume, high scoring offense, which means he'll inevitably have those big games. And that's going to push his end of season numbers up. But outside of those big games, he is going to be putting points up that are not going to be favorable for you. Uh, he'll be getting those six, eight, nine point games where you're going to be looking for someone to be giving you 10 to 15. Um, but eventually he'll have that two touchdown game and he'll finish as a wide receiver three by end of season. Um, so with a healthy DAC, Michael Gallup can do a lot, especially if the case where Amari Cooper or CD land comes out. Uh, due to injury or COVID restrictions or whatever. Um, in a weird situation, Michael Gallup's almost a handcuff receiver. We know what Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, and Dak Prescott can do together. If Amari Cooper's out and it's C.D. Lamb, you're still in the same, same situation where you're looking at someone to have wide receiver two or better numbers week in, week out uh, in a full, full workload uh, as the number two receiver on that team. Um, so he is someone with upside week to week if that happens. Um, but still grabbing him a little bit early for what you're going to be getting. It's just not going to be consistent. Um, not someone I'm going to be targeting, but I'll be targeting later in drafts if he falls because everyone's hot on Cooper and Lamb at the moment. Moving on, we got Tyler Boyd at the 702 going as wide receiver 37. One of the reasons that I've kind of been avoiding the other receivers is the fact that Tyler Boyd's sitting right here. Um, Tyler Boyd is someone that last year when um, – Joe Burrow was playing as quarterback in those first 11 weeks. Tyler Boyd is wide receiver, uh, a top 10 wide receiver three times. Um, and someone that never finished below a top 15. Um, I'm sorry, he was a top 15 five times uh, in those 11 games. He's extremely consistent. He's an extremely great receiver. Last year, T. Higgins and him were able to find a strong role together. Um, and even though Jamar Chase is coming in, Mike, pointed out a really good point. Jamar Chase hasn't played competitive football in a year. Um, he's hasn't really shown out in practice yet. There's already been some reports that he isn't getting the separation that they're looking for. And Tyler Boyd and T Higgins are going to be starting off this year uh, with a healthy Joe Burrow. And more than likely as those number one and two receivers, one A, one B, one C even. Um, I do think that Tyler Boyd does give you a little bit of consistency, uh, especially as these later wide receivers come. Um, but his upside is capped. So he's one of those receivers where I'm targeting if I'm looking for just a player I can play in that flex position every week almost um, and then still have those wide receiver one upside. Moving on at the 703, we've got Russell Wilson. Uh, quarterback six right now, so it, it could be a little low compared to what you saw in the beginning half of the season. But if we see end of season Russ this year, we're going to be hitting a, a complete reason you lose your league. Uh, last year, he was finishing as a quarterback four up to week, quarterback two up to week four. Um, and then after week 11, uh, I'm sorry, after week eight, he only finished up above a quarterback 12 once. Um, 
And even then, he was only quarterback eight on the week. Uh, Seattle's defense last year was giving up so many points in the beginning part of the season uh, to where they just forced Russ to cook. They made him air the ball out. Then he had no other options. Getting into games with the Cowboys and the Falcons, two teams that were allowing a lot of fantasy points last year. Uh, so you're not going to be really getting that comfy feeling, feeling with Russell Wilson in the seventh round right now. There are still quarterbacks that have the upside. Um, and if Russ didn't have that strong start last season, you're looking at someone that's going to be getting you quarterback two numbers. Um, and from what we've seen so far, they're going to let that ball just move. But I, I just don't feel comfortable taking Russell Wilson early if he's a quarterback that I see a lot of value in later in the draft. Um, as someone that falls, I do like other players before him that are currently listed below him. Uh, and one of them will be on this list just coming up soon. Uh, next on the list, though, we do have Trey Sermon, running back 27, going at the 7-4 pick. Uh, he's another running back, kind of like Javante Williams, where there's a lot of expectations of him to take over a very strong role in a run-heavy offense. Uh, by mid to end season with a lot of expectations for his future in seasons to come. He's joining the 49ers and they just have so much depth there uh, already. But Sermon has already started seeing running back one reps with that first team. Uh, so he, he could bring a lot of value for you. Again, if you're someone that's already taken some couple running backs and you can bench someone for the first few weeks until you can see what's coming uh, in the seventh round and you've got that late round quarterback you're going to grab or that late round tight end that's going to bring you upside then you can take them but if you're looking for someone that's going to be giving you stability and you're just going off of ADP make sure you're avoiding Trey Sermon until there's someone that until you're getting into those 32s those those later running backs where they're in a running back by committee and you don't want to be starting them every week anyways uh, coming up next, we got wide receiver 38, pick 705, Mike Williams. Uh, I personally love Mike Williams this year, and I've been someone that's doubted him for years and years and years now. Uh, with Justin Herbert at quarterback, you're looking for someone that's going to be a high-volume deep ball threat, and you really couldn't ask for much more than that. Uh, so if you're grabbing Mike Williams, you're looking at someone that in his – quote-unquote injured season last year uh, was still able to find himself as a top 12 receiver three weeks um, and he's going to continue to be even better um, there are really only three receiving targets on the charges currently and that's Keenan Allen Mike Evans and uh, Austin Eckler uh, and so you do have the upside of Mike Evans finishing as a wide receiver three week to week and then having wide receiver one upside on weeks where he has those big plays. He's going to have a solid floor, and I'm really excited to get him because I do think by end of season, we're going to be talking about someone that finishes a, as a wide receiver 18 or better. Uh, coming up next, we got LaVisca Chenault. He's another solid pick in this late round. I kind of value him a little bit more than DJ Chark, honestly. And that's because I do think that Chenault's someone that has a lot more yard after catch upside. He is another young guy that once they get the ball in his hand, he can do a lot of things. Last year, we saw them using him on the screens, uh, on the end of rounds, on the sweeps, and on the pass catching game. With an upgraded quarterback play, we're going to be seeing a lot more work from Chenault this year. Um, and I do think that he is someone that can find himself as a low-end wide receiver one by end of season if Chark doesn't work out, and he does. Um, I do think that regardless, you're going to be finding him as a wide receiver two. He finishes a wide receiver two 23% of his weeks, and a wide receiver three 65%. Uh, last year in his limited time, um, looking to take another step forward. And they're going to be getting him involved uh, with that quarterback. I'm really excited for that Jags offense. Um, and there's a handful of players I'm looking to grab. Coming up next, we got Chase Edmonds, running back 28. Kind of a risky player with the situation that he's in. Arizona Cardinals running back game hasn't been the strongest with Kenyon Drake and him last year. Um, but he's someone that kind of has a solid floor. If he is in a running back by committee with James Conner, who's the recent addition there in Arizona, he's going to be getting a majority of the pass catching work. So in a half point PPR, a full point PPR league, Chase Edmonds is another guy that's giving you a, a moderate floor, uh, looking at eight to 10 points per game almost, uh, if he gets that pass catching work, especially if he gets the touchdown and he's still that running back one for the team. Um, the problem for me, though, is his upside is completely limited. I do think James Conner is going to be that red zone goal line back. It's going to be getting a majority of the touchdowns in the rushing game there. And with Kyler Murray being a, a very, very good 
rushing quarterback as well, eating into those rushing touchdowns and those gold line opportunities. Edmonds' ceiling's pretty, pretty capped. Um, he's someone I'm only grabbing if I'm looking for some sort of stability early into the season on my team. If he falls way below in the, like the ninth round because no one wants to touch him, maybe I'll take the shot on him, but only if I'm looking for late, late stability because I went zero RB or something. Uh, moving on, we got Juju Smith-Schuster, wide receiver, 40. And honestly, he's another great pick. Uh, a lot of these running backs, I'm not drafting because there's a plethora of solid receiver pickups here that are going to be giving you great, consistent numbers. Uh, the Steelers finished last in rushing yards last season and attempt uh, due to poor offensive line play. And they've only done a little bit to make that a little bit better. They obviously drafted Najee Harris in the first round last year and or in this draft. And he's going to be used very, very uh, predominantly in this offense, but Juju Smith-Schuster did re-sign with the Steelers, and they're not paying the guy just to show up. He is going to be an extremely prominent piece of this offense, actually expected to play more on the outside, uh, where he played when Antonio Brown was there, and he had these big seasons. Last year, Juju lined up in the slot 82% of the times, and Tomlin himself said that they're going to be getting him outside. Uh, in 2018, when we saw the 140 targets, beautiful wide receiver one season from Juju, he was lining up in outside 50% of the time or more uh, and moving him inside and still receiving 20% of the total targets last year. I think Juju can finish wide receiver two in a high-volume offense that he's in, especially if he starts getting into these touchdowns last year's. Chase Claypool, someone that everyone's expecting to take a huge step forward, but as someone that is not going to, uh, he did show a lot of flash, but the flashes were so big. There's just too many expectations. Juju is a very talented receiver, especially in an offense uh, that's going to be throwing the ball. I like him a lot. Um, problem is for me, his upside's limited because there are other targets there. There's just so many targets to go around. And then my, one of my favorite quarterbacks out of the draft, and I love if he's going this late, uh, currently quarterback seven, Justin Herbert. Uh, last year finished his, uh, eight out of his 15 weeks as a quarterback 10, uh, and five out of those 15 as a quarterback five or higher. He's a big arm quarterback throwing the ball for 300 yards and two touchdowns more than six weeks uh, last season in a fast-paced offense. Uh, with his targets like Keenan Allen, as well as Austin Eckler getting banged up last season, um, moving into this second-year offense with the second-year quarterback, I am so excited for it. I think he's someone that's going to be pushing for those 5,000-plus yard season uh, and probably 30 to 40 touchdowns. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of, a lot, a lot of Justin Herbert this year, and everyone that grabs him is going to be extremely happy. Just make sure you're not taking him too early, um, but understand he is someone that a lot of people are going to be targeting. He's not m the most mobile. He will run the ball, uh, and when he does run the ball, it's in touchdown situations. Uh, last year, he got five rushing touchdowns on 55 rushing attempts. That's almost a 10% touchdown percentage. You know, the, 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 guy's, the guy's good. Uh, so make sure you guys are grabbing him, but make sure you guys are grabbing him. Uh, at the value, seventh round is solid. You can really stack up your team by then, and you're still getting high-end quarterback numbers uh, at a consistent, consistent level. Now, one of Mike's favorite people to draft, and if you guys are in a league with him, make sure you're grabbing him uh, above his ADP because that's Antonio Brown currently going as wide receiver 41. Uh, he has been shooting up draft boards. He used to be listed in the ninth round, um, and even then, some people were still sleeping on him. No one wants to remember that though he had his own social antics and maybe he's not everyone's favorite receiver anymore because of that, the guy's still incredibly talented. Uh, last year, he kind of didn't have the end of season finish because he didn't even start playing until week nine with the Bucks, And he really didn't even start getting on a roll until the last three weeks. Uh, in those three weeks, he went 27 catches for four touchdowns, and almost 300 yards. You're talking about almost wide receiver one numbers from someone that's going in the ninth round. Uh, in the seventh to ninth round. Make sure you're getting a part of this. The Tampa Bay offense is going to be extremely uh, high volume this year, I believe, uh, especially with Tom Brady really starting to take a step up in the second half of the season. We could be talking about 600 plus attempts on uh, a 17 game pace. So personally, if you can grab Antonio Brown, he's someone I'm actually willing to take a reach on because I do see that you're going to be getting wide receiver two numbers from him every week uh, with the opportunity for him to have wide receiver one numbers. Uh, regardless of the fact that Mike Evans is there or the fact that Chris Godwin's there, Antonio Brown's going to be taking a, a role uh, early on and often. 
uh, only having three weeks out of his eight weeks last season to fall below 10 points, the consistency factor is going to be there for you. Uh, moving on to running back 29 is actually going to be Damian Harris. Another really safe pick with minimal upside. Um, last year, he was averaging over five yards per carry. Uh, in 30% of his games, he ran for over 100 yards. Um, and then the problem, though, no pass catching work. Dude, dude doesn't get the ball a lot in the air. Uh, in, those th- in those games, he only had five catches, targeted seven times, um, and also did not get a lot of touchdowns, only two on 137 attempts. Um, obviously, Cam Newton was running the ball. But we get Mac Jones in there, or Cam Newton starts running the ball in the red zone. You're talking about someone that could easily shoot up the end of season rankings if he does start getting a full workload. Uh, in the first preseason game, he was the only running back uh, to get an attempt within the first two drives with Cam Newton at quarterback. Um, and then Mac Jones came out looking strong. Um, as a Dolphins fan, I'm personally a little scared. He looked decent. And he looks like he might be taking over that role a little bit earlier than a lot of people were projecting. Um, And in that case, Mac Jones isn't going to be running the ball in 13 times this year. Uh, Damian Harris might get 10 touchdowns. If Damian Harris gets 200 attempts, we're looking at someone that can easily crack 1,000-plus yards. Um, And with those touchdown upside, you're talking about someone that can finish as a top 24 running back, if not better, every week. Uh, I do think that Damian Harris could be a great value for a lot of players. Um, and especially if you're going for those late running backs or looking for that running back on the bench with upside, he's someone you could take. Uh, and then coming off at number uh, wide receiver 42, last pick of the seventh round is Curtis Samuel. He's kind of coming off a hype breakout season, also coming off of an injury where they just came back to practice this week. Uh, he's going to be joining the Washington football team, going to be joining Ryan Fitzpatrick, as well as his coach from Carolina uh, and Ron Rivera. So obviously they do have a role in mind for him. Uh, Rivera definitely wanted Curtis Samuel there because they know what he can do. Um, And he has an opportunity to possibly break a thousand yards this season in total yards, um, taking over a very strong role from that JD McKissick 140 targets last year that we're not really expecting to see again. Um, With only the with the only other receiving targets there being Gibson, uh, Terry McLaurin, and Logan Thomas, there is absolutely every opportunity for Curtis Samuel to finish well above a wide receiver 42 every week, seeing more than likely wide receiver two numbers, uh, wide receiver three numbers on a weekly basis, being extremely consistent with someone that's going to be getting uh, some sort of work almost on a regular role. Uh, I do think Terry McLaurin is someone that's going to be the wide receiver one, but Curtis Samuel quickly comes in as that number two for me. So, guys, that's going to be my rounds six and seven. Uh, If there's anyone that you guys really want to see more about, if there's anyone that I might have missed that maybe you guys have as a super sleeper or someone that you think is just going to really ball out this year, let me know in the comments below. Uh, And while you're down there, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell icon uh, and then hit the like as well. And if you guys are listening on a podcast, Make sure to rate and review this uh, podcast. Let me know how we did. Let me know what you guys like about us. And then as well, get your guys' shot at winning that Kyler Murray helmet in our listener league. Now, stay tuned for tomorrow's episode where Mike will be doing rounds eight and nine. Uh, Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I will see you again. Thank you, guys.